So over the last eight years, we've had a few mental performance coaches in the podcast. Just recently, we had a high performance coach, Dr. Michael Gervais. Now in today's episode, we've got a unique guest in this space. She is an expert on working with female athletes in high school sports and partnering with parents. Coach Bree is a certified mental performance coach and the co-founder of The Elite Competitor. They are a company that leads the pack in cultivating confidence in girl athletes through their mom-daughter approach to mental training. As a former collegiate athlete, um, currently she's a mom and a long time coach to athletes. She not only supports the athlete through proven and science-backed strategies to strengthen their mental game, but she's also coaching parents on how to best support their athlete daughters through the process. Her work has impacted thousands of families and, and really has changed the game when it comes to middle and high school sports experience for all these athletes and now teams. Um, because I'm also really impressed with her new program for coaches, the plug and play elite mental game. Uh, and it is a really simple and practical um, resource and tool. I think there's a lot of great resources for coaches on the mental game, but most aren't designed by coaches and coaches who are really honestly experts uh, who really understand the limitations of a coach's time, a team's time, an athlete's attention, and also their level of interest or appetite for mental training. So Coach Bree, she gets it, so we're excited to support her work as well. Welcome to the Coaching Culture Podcast. My name is JP Nurbin, and I'm joined by my co-host, Betsy Butterick, today. Our mission here is simple. We want to help coaches become better leaders and build better team cultures. If you're interested in learning more about our work as leadership coaches and facilitators, or if you want to explore our online courses and books, head on over to tocculture.com and betsybutterick.com. While you're at tocculture.com, don't forget to subscribe to our weekly newsletter. It's packed with notes from each podcast episode, our latest articles, and practical culture building tips. Now let's get right into it with Coach Bree. Coach Bree, thank you so much for joining us today. And I know there's a lot of value that you can provide for our audience around the work that you do. Before we get into that, my first question for you, knowing that arguably mental skills and, and some of the training that we are intentional about with young people is a very saturated space. So there's so many people offering so many different tools and techniques to work with young athletes. What for you was the tipping point of, you know what, I need to do this work. I can't not do this work. So what was the initial tipping point to get you into this space? And then also what actively keeps you purpose-driven in this space? Yeah, that's a great question. By the way, thank you so much for having me on. Um, I appreciate both of you and the works that you do in each of your spaces that have helped me tremendously as a coach myself. So thank you for having me on. Um, I guess that question leads me all the way back to when I was an athlete. <laughs> I can't, I mean, I'm remiss to you know, mention, if I didn't mention, really, that's, that's where it started. I was a multi-sport athlete growing up. Um, I actually quit my sport, which was volleyball, my senior year of high school. And why this matters is because looking back on why I did that, it was because internally I was struggling a lot with self-doubt. I was kind of going through all the normal things that all athletes go through, like I would make a mistake and kind of struggle coming back from that. I would worry about what my coaches are thinking, what my parents are thinking. I was a highly recruited athlete too. I was getting like a lot of offers from colleges and I just felt this enormous pressure. Like I didn't want to let anybody down. And so instead of um, seeing this as an opportunity to bring my game to the next level, I saw it as an opportunity to kind of throw it back in my face that I am not you know, good enough or I might not be good enough playing at that level. So I felt like it was an easier choice for me just to like walk away at the end of my senior season kind of disappointing a lot of people in my eyes. Um, and so that was like my first, looking back now, you know, like 16 years removed, I'm like, I totally see what's going on there. Like, I just did not have any of the skills. No one was talking about it. So like, no one was talking about mental health. Like, we didn't have the Simone Biles there, like talking about like the pressure and the nerves, like just, there was no examples of it. And I actually, I went to a college um, that was, had a really good volleyball program and I went to every single game. They made it to the national championship. I missed it so much. And I realized like, okay, hey, it's not volleyball that I miss. It's this feeling of like, how do I handle 
the, the pressure, the nerves, the mistakes, letting people down, like all of those things. Um, and I missed it so much that I actually reached out to the coach after they came back from this national championship run. And I was like, just on a whim, like, you know, told her my story and I'm like, any chance, anything. And she was like, why don't you come? Uh, you know, I'm going to offer you a tryout. So I got to try out with the team and just got to go practice with them that fall or that, um, that winter after their fall season. And she, after that offered me a walk-on spot on their team. And I was like, I I'll pay you. Like, I don't care. You don't need to pay me anything. I'm so happy to be a part of this volleyball again. And as luck would have it, um, this coach is phenomenal. Like she supports the whole athlete, brought in a lot of resources around mental health, you know, talked about the mental side of the game. It's kind of the first time that I got exposed to like, oh, like other people deal with nerves and pressure and here's some tools to be able to do that. I studied sports psychology as my undergrad because I was really interested in it. By the time I was a senior, I was loving volleyball, playing the best volleyball in my life. I was a full ride scholarship athlete at that point, had worked towards that. Um, and so honestly, that's as I look back in my story, I'm like, that's really where I realized like how important the side of the game is. And even just normalizing what athletes go through, like these are very normal parts of being an athlete. Um, I became a coach right away. Like I became a teacher, um, a high school teacher, became a volleyball coach right away. And then also then realized, oh, my athletes are still struggling with the same things that I struggled with, you know, 12 years removed, like they're still having a hard time making their serve when the pressure is on, like they're still feeling like they're not good enough and practicing really well and then crumbling in a game. And so about five years into my coaching career, I was, um, I had very talented teams. Um, I had two teams that were like ranked number one and two in the state. And we lost in the district championship match two years in a row in five sets, like track and volleyball, five set by two points, reverse sweep situation where we won the first two sets and lost the next three to not even make it to state. <laughs> and so I had to look at myself as a coach at that point. I'm like, oh, okay, so this happened two years in a row. I have very talented athletes. It's not the physical part of the game that is lacking, right? They're, they're putting in work, they want it, but there is something that's happening where they can't make that translate in the moments that it matters most. And so I had to kind of look at myself as a coach and I'm like, I got to figure this out. And so I dove back into like, okay, the mental side of the game, I'd be, I went through a certification to become certified as a mental performance coach, um, started learning, implementing right away. My team latched onto it. Long story short, um, developed a whole program to teach the mental side of the game to athletes um, that is now serving thousands of athletes and um, families of athletes, as well as coaches and teams that are competing at the high school level. So that is the story in a nutshell on, you know, where, where I came yeah. from and it keeps me going too, because this is also keeping athletes going by having. Yeah. That That's awesome. And, and you're telling that story about, you know, just missing going to state two years in a row. And um, I was just visiting a campus in their department. They have a program. There are four runner up national championship trophies from consecutive years. And they told me, they're like, Betsy, we've been a few points away four years in a row. And it's not that we're not talented. And so I think when you mention, you know, this barrier continues to exist, the mental side, the, the different blocks that people have, um, it's wonderful that you have developed tools to be able to provide resources for the way that athletes experience that barrier in respect to their sport and also to provide their support people with resources as well. So very glad to have you here. Yeah, thank you. There's the couple of things about your journey that I really connect with. One is that you were a walk-on. I was a walk-on. Yeah. My my journey was not as successful, though. I didn't earn a full scholarship uh, at South Carolina. Um, eventually, um, they moved on with, from me. <laughs> Wasn't that talented? So maybe I could have used some of your mental side, <laughs> uh, mental training there. That's for sure. But um, I think it's really actually the thing I really connect with is your coaching journey that you kind of got into this point, you go down the, the road and you see some frustrations and some struggles to, you know, help your team make the leap. You know, for me, it was, it was a big cultural uh, challenges that kept us from performing at the level that I knew we could perform at, you know, getting to our potential. And so then, then you kind of come back into this work to, you know, for you and like for me, it's like, okay, well, what is culture for you? It's like, what is the mental side and getting back in there and getting certified, getting trained up in that, and then going off and doing that for other people. So I think it's just, it says a lot. I think there's a, what I, what I respect a lot about you is that you are a coach still today. You still coach teams. So, you know, the challenges and the struggles that coaches face, not just with the mental side, 
but finding time to do this with their teams, right? Like everyone's like, oh, the, the mental side is important. But you know what's also more important right now is installing that offense, that defense, or exactly. working on our serves or whatever it is, right? So I think that's also what makes you special is that you you are a coach today. So you really understand the the limitations and the challenges that, that coaches face. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I know it just as much as anyone, like we just started our season. We're in week three and yeah, same thing. It's like, I have all these onboarding things. We've got to learn the systems. I have a new team. I mean, we're coming off of three state championships. Um, so defending state championships that this new group didn't even earn. And so like kind of yeah, they're stepping into big roles with huge targets on their back and arguably like the mental side of the game is super important with that and dealing with that, but they have so much to learn. And so I'm even as a coach, like, okay, you know, I'm realistic. We're not, we can't spend hours on the mental side of the game. Like we have to get in, in the, in the gym and we've got to actually like, we got to work on these skills. So mental training alone doesn't work just like physical, physical training alone only gets you so far and mental training without also like a culture that is supportive and without coaches who understand the, their, the power of their words and communicating. Like that's why we, we kind of have to have this interconnectedness when it comes to the, the full package, but it can be overwhelming for sure. Yeah. And, and I think what also I want to kind of ask a question here on is that makes you special too, as you mentioned earlier, is you bring the parents into the equation in your work. And typically I think the mental coaches out there that I see, it's like they just want the parents to cut the check so they can do the work, right? Yeah. But you actually want the parents part of the conversation. Talk about, you know, what's the value of bringing the parents into the conversation around this mental mental side of the game? Yeah. Well, honestly, a lot of parents that I talk to are struggling themselves with what to say to help their athletes. They're like, she's, um, you know, irritable before before they compete. And I don't know what to say. Everything I say is the wrong thing. And then they want to like bite my head off or in the car ride on the way home, like, you know, as coaches and athletes are like, we know that that's a sacred time. And a lot of times parents are just lost because they're like, I don't, I don't know what to say. She's beating herself up. Nothing I say, I can't even compliment her correctly without her like turning it negative. And so right away we were like, well, <laughs> the parent needs to be a part of this equation. You know, the parent shapes the environment, the parent provides the opportunities. And, um, you know, we can get into it a little bit in this, but like there's there's a lot of research around a parent's influence on their kid's confidence, too, and how we talk about ourselves and how we carry ourselves and how that impacts how our kids see themselves. And so just knowing some of that research is, you know, kind of made it really obvious to us that we need to include the parents, not only to give them some tangible tools and strategies around like, what do you say? What do you not say? What builds their confidence? What cuts their confidence? But also like, let's look at ourselves. We get a, a lot of, I, we have a lot of parents in our program who are former athletes or who are coaching their own kids. And it's really easy to get our egos caught up in that and our agenda. And it's amazing how our kids trigger things in us. And when we see them out on the court in the field of competing and we're like, oh my gosh, like they're, they're, I don't want them to go to them the same, the same path as me. And we get like kind of our pride wrapped up in it. So we go deep like in that, in that part of our, our program, because we know how important a parent's influence is on an athlete's confidence. Coach me up real quick here. I'm going to throw a real life scenario here. Hopefully my daughter doesn't listen to this podcast in the next few years and then, you know, scorn me. Um, but yeah, so two, two instances, instances with my daughter recently, one, I just said, Hey, let's go out and let's hit around. Uh, she plays a sport in Ireland called camogie or hurling. Uh, for those that don't know that most listeners here, you can listen, look it up on YouTube. Pretty cool sports, Irish sport. But anyways, we're hitting around and very difficult, very technical skill sport. And she's just really struggling to hit off her weak side. Um, and just really getting frustrated. And I'm just out there to have a good time. And it just, the whole moment just completely deteriorates. And I try to offer words of encouragement, no luck, right? So she she can have these moments where she's struggling and it's just like, well, I ask her, well, do you want me to help you? Or you just, well, you want some space? And and mm -hmm. I just get evil, evil stares, uh, daggers coming out of her eyes. And then, you know, just the other day, actually her, her brother played really, really well in a football match. And we were, you know, giving him appropriate praise, giving him some affirmation around, hey, you've been really working hard at this. It's just great to see you come out there and play really well. Isn't, doesn't that feel good? Yeah. So she's, and she here overhears me and my wife talking on the sidelines about how well he's playing. And she's just a wreck the rest of the day because we were giving him affirmation and she overheard that. So 
just from what I've told you right there, can you coach me up a little bit around some things that I could do and my wife could do to help my daughter based upon what you, what, you, what little you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, honestly, JP, you're probably, you're, you're doing a lot of things, right? Um, I would say as long as she is initiating that, like the extra reps, the extra practice, practice, which sounds like she is like, you're just like, I'm here because you want to be here. Um, you know, all of those things. And it's okay that she's disappointed. We always, not saying that this is maybe the case for you, but for a lot of parents in our program, um, they are, they struggle when their kids are disappointed. I mean, for a good reason, it's hard to see our kids upset, but um, sometimes that sets off red flags for them because they're like, oh my gosh, you know, they shouldn't be disappointed. They should be happy. They should be blah, blah, blah. And like, we want to get them back to this. And I think just recognizing like, hey, this is a hard skill right now. Like you're it, just, even that validation um, is really important. We lean on Dr. Becky Kennedy's work around confidence and around, um, you know, the research when it comes to parenting and um, a lot of what she says around confidence is confidence is self-trust. And at the root of it, we want our kids to trust themselves and trust how they're feeling. So even recognizing, you know, like, you know, you're disappointed right now, you're having a hard time, that's going to happen. You know how you feel. And just, uh, just a little bit of validation. Um, the other thing we talk about is highlighting positive innate qualities. So we talk about PIQs um, is how we describe them. And um, so just highlighting some of those things, which I'm sure you do. I know I know you do this, JP, but like highlighting, um, you know, things outside of, of her sport and what she's doing well, like who she is as a person, um, her work ethic, noticing things that don't directly relate to her sport so that it doesn't become just this you know, I'm only like recognizing things related to the outcome of, of what you're doing well in, I can't remember the name of this, um, this game, but <laughs> um, yes. So like highlighting those positive innate qualities as much as you can, um, I think is, is key. There's another thing. Oh, something that may or may not work. Um, we just always throw out tools that, you know, have helped some parents and you know, mm -hmm. they, they, you can take it or leave it. Um, but in those moments when she's frustrated, she's point, like nothing's going well, she's throwing you daggers, asking the question, is there anything I can do right now that would make this worse? And just mm -hmm. flipping it to her uh, to like, first, like why this works for some athletes is it's recognizing like, this is a tough moment. Okay. I want to help. And I could be doing things to make it better. It could be doing things to make it work. I don't, I'm not really sure. But is there anything from your perspective that I could do to make this worse for you right now? And sometimes athletes are like, yeah, stop coaching me. Like, yeah, I, you know, if you continue to tell me the same thing over and over, I'm going to break down. And so it's just another way to like a different way to approach the situation that's, uh, you know, just kind of makes them think a little bit differently. Like, and, and it can uncover some of those things that could be not helping. Yeah, I love that. And um, I think a version of that that I've used with athletes is when you ask them, what do you want? A lot mm -hmm. of times people struggle to articulate what they want. Yes. An easier access point is sometimes when you say, like, what don't you want? Because people are pretty clear based on their past experience what they don't want. And it sounds like that's a really great application of a very similar question of like, what can I do to make this worse? Because initially it's a little jarring. It's like, what do you mean? Why would you want to make this worse? But then you get information that you might not get otherwise despite your best intentions to try to make it better. So I really love how that's phrased and the way that that maybe hits differently than a lot of questions that we ask either our children or our athletes. I think about the importance of the, you know, what conversations are happening at home. And so I've got a situation hypothetical that I would also like you to, to coach me up in. Um, so my daughters are three and a half and one and a half and my wife and I have had that conversation of, okay, raising young women we want them to have a, a positive body image which means we need to be really conscious of how we talk about ourselves and mm -hmm. as the individual who did not carry both of our children i would transparently say i feel like i'm in my dad bod phase of you know don't get to work out as often as i like running after two kids fairly busy with work and this yeah. is just where we are and thinking about the number of parents of athletes specifically young women let's say you've got a coach whose team is going through this program and they're learning all these different tools. And the reality is at home, one or both parents are incredibly negative or critical. Mm -hmm. So um, if I'm working with an athlete on their inner critic or inner voice, they'll give their voice a name, it can be any name except theirs, and then they'll write down what that voice says. And then at some point, depending on the depth I wanna go with that athlete, I'll ask them like, who said this to you? 
and they'll realize maybe for the first time, like, oh, it was mom or it was dad or it was some influential person in life. When that's true for an athlete, what advice would you have for a coach on how to best work with them knowing that voice has been ingrained maybe from an early age, from a person that they arguably love or they're very close to, and yet it's holding them back from performing the way that they want to? Is there anything a coach can do in that space? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a great question. I do, I have a similar approach to you, Betsy. So, you know, we give that inner critic a name. Um, we talk about, all right, this is a part of you, but it's not you. And, you know, depending, as you said, how deep you want to go with athletes, um, it's also worth noting that often we show up and be based on how we were you know, what was modeled for us. And sometimes that some of that self-compassion can come in. And I think that athletes can realize that even like in high school, you know, hurt people, hurt people, that type of, of um, you know, that analogy I think does hold true in this sense. Um, so that's, that's where I would start um, other than just realizing like, Hey, you know, this parts, the internal family systems is kind of like where this methodology comes from and realizing that like, this is a part of you. It's not you, no matter where it came from. And, um, you can decide like, you know, if you can, if you want to turn it up or turn it down. I really like this idea of turning it up or turning it down, because I think sometimes we unintentionally make too far of a leap by asking them to turn it off. Right. Yeah. Like even in like a negative situation or scenario, when we say like, you have to be positive, it's like, well, that feels really untrue right now. Like, Positive would be the total opposite of what I'm experiencing emotionally. So I love the idea of turning it up or down, adjusting that dial versus turning it on or off because that just feels more accessible. So thank you. So one, one, and I'm, we're going to keep throwing some challenging questions here, your way, Coach Bree. Um, I was just talking with a coach the other day and she just took on a new field hockey team and whole new set of players and she sent out some google forms got some feedback around you know learning about the players what they struggle with what they feel confident in and almost unanimously across her team i think everyone but maybe two players said i really struggle in pressure moments or when i'm not not even as much pressure moments as when i make mistakes mm -hmm. and so they communicate that they all struggle with the stress the anxiety in the moment and at the same time they all ask to be, you know, that we, we want feedback. We want you to be tough on us. We want you to coach you. Now I know, and this coach knows, like players say they want to be coached. They say they want the feedback, but when they're in a moment when they're stressed and they're triggered and they're frustrated and they're not playing well, they don't seem to listen very well or want the feedback. So as a coach, how do we work with athletes on their ability to be coached in moments when things aren't going well, because it's not going to be like me out there with my daughter, right? Like I can't yeah. expect the coach to, to treat like, Hey, honey, do you want to, you know, want me to still coach you here? It's like, no, no, that's the coach's job. All right. Yeah. So the coach is going to have to coach. So how do coaches, you know, coach athletes in those moments when they're struggling, making mistakes, but they're really, really triggered. Yeah. Great question. And a lot of this comes down to preloading skills and as you said, it's very difficult to coach when an athlete is dysregulated. I mean, we have toddlers and young kids and like when we see though our kiddos on the ground dysregulated, we, it, it does, it's no good to go up to them and say, calm down, you know, like it just doesn't work. And that is the kind of the same thing that happens when athletes are dysregulated in that moment. And then we're trying to coach them and give them feedback. It's like, they are not in a mental space. Like they're, I mean, neurologically what's happening is their Paris or their sympathetic nervous system is taking over. Their amygdala is sensing some sort of psychological threat to their safety. Like, so all of these things are happening in their body. That's actually like the prefrontal cortex is being hijacked. Like they're not actually able to take in what you're, what you're saying. So, which is frustrating as a coach because that's your job and you need them to listen. And so um, what we do is we, we pre-teach strategies so that athletes can be more regulated and then the coaching is better received. And one of the um, main strategies that we teach is a simple fa failure recovery system called the snapback routine. Um, the concept is very simple, but it's pre-teaching this awareness to athletes of what, um, what triggers you, 
what like we kind of describe it like a stoplight. If you're green and in flow state, that means like you're playing well, you're not really thinking about much, you're in, you're, you're doing your thing. Um, yellow is something happens. So maybe a ref makes a bad call, a teammate says something, a coach yells at you, uh, you miss a play, whatever, like you're starting to feel a little off. And then red is you're dysregulated. It's going to be really hard to coach that athlete in that moment. They're spiraling. Then they hesitate. Then you got to pull them off. And now you've got to waste time trying to get them back in the game. Maybe your bench isn't that deep. you got a freshman in now and the wheels fall off. Okay. And so that's what we want to avoid. Um, and so by pre-teaching like some awareness around what, like we actually have athletes like sit down, like what situations put you into yellow? And it's different for every athlete. I mean, there are some common themes like mistakes and like specific mistakes. And then teaching them a different way, you know, because what's your common response um, to mistakes is what we ask athletes. And there's my common response is I am thinking about like, shoot, I shouldn't have done that. Um, you know, maybe I'm hesitating. If they're really honest with themselves. Like I hesitate, you know, instead of going, going for the next play, I'm going to tip the ball. I'm going to play it safe. They're going to adjust their mechanics a little bit, which then we know as coaches leads to more mistakes. And so that's their like ingrained kind of pattern response. And we're like, okay, we're going to teach you a different way. And um, the snapback routine for us is just a combination of a, an intentional breath to engage their parasympathetic nervous system. So just teach like an intentional belly breath, um, a reset word that they say at the top of that breath. And that reset word is actually found through um, looking at their best playing moments and how they have felt in that moment um, and kind of distilling it down to a word that, want, that reminds them of how they want to be and how they want to show up in that moment. And then on their exhale, they're doing some sort of reset signal. So it's a grounding signal, really simple, like, you know, uh, fingers together or snapping or adjusting a hair tie, something very simple that they can do. The snapback routine should take less than a second. Um, and that is just something that, again, engages parasympathetic nervous system, a mantra or a grounding word to remind them of who they are and who they want to be, a reset signal to also ground them in the present moment. And just that little like, okay, we're good. now we're back. And we pre we pre teach that and then athletes practice it in practice. So in low stakes environments, you know, like, Hey, we're doing a water break. Do your snapback routine before you get your water. Um, you know, it's a station. It's a pre-practice station. Like we're in this beginning phase right now of our season. So it's a station, you know, because you're going to do your snapback routine here and move on so that they can call on that in those moments um, where we're in a game and it is pressure. And now I have a tool that I can uh, rely on. And then we've also visualized it. So we see it like athletes are visualizing all the time. We all are. We're always creating images in our head of like, worst case scenario, likely, um, because our brain's trying to protect us. So we visualize a new response. Okay. The ref made a bad call. All right. Here's how I'm going to respond. I'm going to take a deep breath and say my reset word. I'm back in the huddle with my team, high-fiving exhale. Okay. Next play. And so they're seeing themselves and creating that pattern over and over of like, this is how we're going to respond. And so now you have an athlete who is regulated, like for the most, for the most part, you know, and now your coaching can land because you're not fighting this, like, prefrontal cortex offline dysregulation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so much of what you're saying, I mean, I love that you're actively teaching coaches how to work with their athletes to do this because I hear this all the time. Betsy, they say they want the truth and I give them the truth and it's not well received. And I'm like, Ooh, this is like, we're missing each other. You think your information is not well received. Their reality is they cannot in that moment receive the information because of the emotional dysregulation. But then coaches are like, well, what do I do about that? Like, I'm not a sports psychologist. I don't know how to teach that stuff. So I think you've made it very simple and accessible. I even love the idea of it being a station, right? We think of like mental skills and even pre-teaching as things that take time and I have to learn how to do them and then I have to implement them and I have to facilitate them. When they're woven into the fabric of your training, when you're given opportunities in the context of your sport or a normal training environment, to lean into and practice them before you need them. And I think that's the other big thing you hit on there, Bree, is, you know, so often coaches want athletes to have skills that they have not trained in low stakes environments. Yeah. And they're like, well, but they know it's pretend. It's like they do. And on a certain level, your brain doesn't, you know, like it is going to get the reps that it needs to be able to make a different choice or have a different experience in that moment. But if we haven't trained it in a low stakes environment, it's very unlikely we're going to have it in a high stakes moment. My question, a slight pivot away from this is what about coaches? So our ability to respond, to give feedback that's helpful instead of just an emotional release of how we're feeling based off of what we just saw in competition, what would you, one, could you use the same strategy for yourself as a coach if you're, you're working to regulate? And if not the same strategy, what advice would you have for coaches out there that recognize, hey, 
I need to manage my own emotional response first before I can give better quality feedback to my athletes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, first it does apply to coaches. In fact, um, coaches who are doing our plug and play elite mental game, I tell them in the intro, like your team's mental game is only as strong as yours, really, because you cannot expect them to be regulated and, uh, you know, respond to mistakes. If you're not like this, is a, that's a, you know, parenting number one, <laughs> like you got, it's just like coaching, like you, you have to be able to, to model it as well. And you can't expect something from your athletes that you're not willing to do yourself. So we tell, I tell coaches um, as they're going through the program, like your athletes are applying this to mistakes, you know, to the pressure situations and you're applying it to your coaching in those situations and, you know, what triggers you and what gets you dysregulated. Um, and so, yeah, the strategies do apply. I would also say, Betsy, like I've used a lot of your, like just the way that you coach coaches on how to deliver communicate, like deliver information is key. So I think regulating ourselves is number one and knowing what triggers us as coaches um, is, is essential, but then also like having the tools and the language so that you, your delivery lands too. So I've learned a lot about like, you know, even just saying like, I'm going to give you some, what might be tough information right now to hear, you know, and just like things like that, that are just so helpful as a coach when I'm delivering information. Um, but yeah, that regulation is, is key for coaches too. I don't, I'm as a coach myself, like I don't, there are, I can count on one hand how many moments I've been like angry in a game coaching, but um, I don't know if that's normal, but I like, I get overwhelmed. No, no, no. I mean, like, one hand too. In my, I did, I did an octopus. In my head, I'm like, JP like, doesn't have enough hands. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> where that's are my hands? Good on one hand is really hands? Yeah. Yeah. Not where are my hands? Sorry. Yeah. I mean, like, cannot. And, but I get so overwhelmed to the point where like, I forgot to put my libero in and like a championship match, you know, like that is what, you know, I internalize a lot. And so I have to know that about myself. Like, Ooh, this is like, this pressure is a lot. I need to like, make sure I'm calling on my assistants and I'm, you know, doing all that, but yeah, we're all different. <laughs> Thank you. JP, we'll work on your octopus arms soon. <laughs> yeah, there's octopus arms, there we go. Yeah, there's just, I just love so much about this, I mean, I, I think, and even Betsy's question just made me think about my journey as a coach and when I you know, had more outbursts than I had hands for sure. And yet there was moments where we would, I was working on some of this mental stuff with my players, not, not to the level that you're, you're offering there because your, your stuff is just fantastic there. I love how so simple it was, but the training and the wrapping it. But we were reading about the mental stuff and we were having conversations, but I would, I'd be at that moment where I'd be about to lose it. And I could turn to my team and say, all right, I'm really struggling. I'm about to lose it right now. And that was almost like this cue to like, they'd offer, they'd, they'd oftentimes fix the issue that was driving me crazy. Or they would just be like, no, it's okay, coach. We got you, you know, like, and they would do something that would make me laugh or something to help me to reset mm -hmm. myself. So I just love the journey that you've been on. I, I think I've got one question before we let you get out of here. And I know we're not, I want you to talk too as well about some of the stuff that you're doing with your, your course for coaches there. But when you think about this work that you've been doing as recently helping mothers, daughters, families, your own team, mm -hmm. what is the biggest impact um, in your own parenting that this work has helped? Because I know you've got a six-year-old, three-year-old or six-year-old, four-year-old, I think. Um, yeah, and I'm just always interesting because it was actually interesting when you were talking to Dr. Michael Dre about this. And, and mm -hmm. one thing that he talked about was just the importance of how what we're doing translates to the most important area of our life, which is the home life. So yeah, how has it helped you uh, as a mother? Yeah. Wow. I didn't expect that, that question, <laughs> um, but I love it because it's everything. I mean, um, I, I can, I can speak from kind of two angles here first, like just the work itself, because I'm so immersed right now in the research. And I'm like, I, I work with moms of athletes every single day and see like how impactful, even, you know, hearing them, like I'm just changing you know, how, how I talk about myself, I'm changing how I'm showing up and my daughter's noticing, you know, and um, even when we think like our teens and tweens are not paying attention like they are. Yeah, and that's super appropriate. And again, I just, if we can put like a exclamation point on the work that you do in support of it, 
for parents to know that, yeah, it might feel, you know, a little, there may be some resistance maybe at the beginning, even what you mentioned about like, oh, okay, I'm to blame for my daughter's confidence issues, right? Like, let's take that one on. Um, but to recognize that in doing the work, you're also given the opportunity to work on yourself. So I love that you just thought through like how to make this something that benefits not just the athlete in this moment in their sport, but benefits perhaps the family, the relationship, and the future that they have together. So thank you for what you do in this space. It's really adding immense value. Yes, thank you. Yeah, and it's such a, I mean, it's, it's just like the, as parents, to Bessie's point, us modeling it, it's the same with us as coaches, mm -hmm. you know, are we modeling that? That's what Dr. Mark Gervais was talking about as well on our podcast is just, this is work that we can do together. So when it comes to work that we do together, you you have a course, tell us about the course, because I think that, you know, honestly, what you just shared with the, the, the red light, green light, yellow light, mm -hmm. like that, that was so simple. And it was like, probably the majority of that is like, actually on the court, not in a classroom, there's a little bit of classroom time that's like, we're actually going to train it. So tell us about the course there. Yeah. So we took our flagship program, um, kind of what we've been talking about with moms and parents and athletes and turned it into a plug and play system for coaches. And mostly it was out of necessity because we just had so many coaches coming to our trainings for sports parents. And they're like, do you have this for coaches? Like, I need this for my team. Like, I don't have time to go learn a bunch of sports psychology and all this. And, and we are like, Oh, kind of not really. And then, so we decided like, it just became overwhelming that we were like, we need a solution for coaches. That's easy and simple. And so we created the plug and play version of the elite mental game. And so basically this is a program that coaches can implement with their team. They get their team together. It's designed to be facilitated in a group setting. They play the videos. They're very short. They're from me. Um, three to 15 minutes. Again, I was a high school teacher for 10 years. So um, I bring in my like my background and in teaching into this. And so they play They have a little lesson plan that goes along with it, lead a short discussion afterwards, and then they go on to practice and implement the skills that they learned. And like you said, JP, they're, they're simple, you know, the snapback routine, box breathing, is, or I mean, more than box breathing, but like breathwork techniques, um, pre practice and pre performance routines to help them with nerves, like very simple things that athletes use. We also have visualizations in there. And I know that every coach is at different level of like comfort when it comes to visualization. So we have visualizations from me that you can play, you can read it if you're the type of coach that wants to read it. And also um, all athletes can get them to their phones so they can just have them like on their phone, easily accessible before games. So it's a whole system um, in implementation. It takes about 30 minutes a week. And at that pace, a coach would get through the whole program in about 12 weeks. So we've mapped it out. Like if you have a 12 week season, 30 minutes a week, but athletes can go or parents can go slower not athletes or parents, coaches can go slower or faster, depending on like what's going on that week. Like this next, this coming week, we have a big travel week. So we're just doing our daily mindset routine, which they learn in that. And that's a five minute routine they do before practice that gets a little affirmation in there, gets visualization, keeps their mental training top of mind. Um, but the week after we're home and we're not traveling. So we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into perfectionism and talking about like their relationship with perfectionism and how that part of them shows up and, and things like that. So um, that's the system in a nutshell for coaches. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for sharing that. And I, I just double click or highlight the concept that you are a coach as well too. Yeah. And I think that you understand, especially at the high school level, what's the availability, what's the time, what's the resources. Yeah. Not everybody needs to be an expert or even be able to teach this. You also have a background in teaching. I knew there was something else we, we, we had a connection to. We were both oh, teachers okay. once upon a time. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's just awesome. So thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. Uh, for those that want to follow you and learn more, where should they head? Yeah, I'm at Elite Competitor Coach on Instagram. Um, for coaches who are looking for more information about the plug and play elite mental game, I'll give uh, JP the link, but there's a free training that I do that just kind of outlines like, hey, here's simple ways you can train the mental game on your team. And we also talk about plug and play. Um, and that's at coach.elitecompetitor.com forward slash training. So again, I'll give that link and also the direct link to the program in case there's coaches that are like, yep, yeah, let's get going. I'm starting my season. I want to get this in, in play. Fantastic. All right. That's it for today's episode. I'd encourage you to check out the plug and play elite mental game for coaches. We'll have links in the details of this episode and in our newsletter this week. Thanks for listening to the coaching culture podcast. 
Yes, we always appreciate you leaving us a review to boost our podcast rating, but what we really appreciate the most is that you share these episodes with your athletes, um, with your athletes' parents, uh, with your friends in coaching and other leaders. Uh, these are great conversation starters. So please do share and don't for forget to subscribe to the Coaching Culture Podcast so you don't miss another episode.